And tonight, we're going to start on the garments of the priest. Now, this photo right here is from the Jerusalem Museum. And they just kind of give you an example right there of what the, what the priest looked like. Now, there were some questions from last week that I want to answer uh, through my research. Uh, the questions that we had, I'm going to go ahead and answer them. So there was a question last week. Old, Te well, Old, Old Testament quotes in the book of Hebrews. Did everybody do their homework? Read the book of Hebrews? So if you go through, you'll notice a lot of Old Testament quotes. I counted. Did anybody count? I got to 85, but somebody said it was more than that. References to the Old Testament is over 100. Yeah. But actual quotes, like to put in quotes from a, from a yeah. verse, I counted 37. That's what I counted. How many? 37. There, the whole thing is reference to the Old Testament, but as far as quotes go, you can go back and do this yourself and, and see. But that's what I counted. Also, there were 17 references to the Lord Jesus being the high priest in Hebrews 17. The next question was, what day was the day of the week, the day of atonement? Right? You asked that question, what like, was it Friday or Saturday or whatever the case is? So, So that was the tenth day of the seventh month, whatever day that was. I want to read what Edersheim says, Alfred Edersheim. He says, um, the names Day of Atonement, or in the Talmud, which uh, devotes to it a special tractate, simply the day in Hebrews, or the fast in Acts, um, sufficiently designate its general object. It took place on the tenth day of the seventh month, Tishri. So Tishri, who knows when Tishri is? The month of Tishri. September, October. That's when, that's ours. September, October. That's what Tishri is. So it took place on the 10th day, 7th month of September, October. Uh, that is symbolically when the, sa the sacred or Sabbath of months had just attained its completeness. So we know that the Jewish, the beginning of the Jewish year was March, April. The 7th month was their Sabbath, the, the month Sabbath. You have a week of Sabbath, or Sabbath of weeks, Sabbath of months, Sabbath of years. And then you have a Jubilee, oh. all right? So, nor must, nor must we overlook the position of that day relatively to the other festivals. The seventh or sabbatical month closed the festival cycle of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was on the 15th. So I printed out this year, this year, um, the 15th of Tishri was October 5th, and it was on a Thursday. Every year it changes. It's going to change days, all right? So going way back, uh, this includes, um, we got to remember that they had a lunar calendar. We have a Gregorian calendar. Five days were added. Then there's leap years and all these things added in there. So if, there's no telling. It's a different day every year. So the next question was, who is the second priest? In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 52, 24. So this man right here, John Holm, he wrote a book called A Scripture of History, The Jewish People and Its Republic. It was written in 1737. I'm just going to read an excerpt out of that that explains this. There could not be any more than one high priest at one time. But, at, but as his office was a very weighty charge, it appears that he had a deputy under him. For the sacred service of the temple, called by the Jews the Sagan. So the second priest was called the Sagan by the Jews. All right. um, his business was to supply the function of the high priest in case of sickness or that any other incapacity attended him upon the solemn day of expiation or other holy days. This appears to have been very necessary. For as the succession in the high priesthood was hereditary, it happened sometimes that the person who succeeded was meanly qualified for so high a trust, and therefore a man of learning and experience was very requisite, both to assist him in the execution of his office and to oversee the inferior priest 
and the different char uh, and the discharge of theirs. There is indeed no express institution of this office by the law. So in the Bible, it doesn't talk about them putting this in, you know, God saying this is what needs to happen. They just actually did this. Uh, unless we reckon that such mentioned in Numbers 3, 20, uh, 32, where Eliezer, during the life of his father Aaron, is appointed to be chief over the chief of the Levites and was to have the oversight of them who kept the charge of the sanctuary. For by that his authority appears to be not much inferior to his father Aaron's, who was high priest at the time. So the deputy priest was put there in case the high priest was sick or he had some infirmity or things like that. And it was hereditary, so it would be his son. Uh, if it wasn't his son, then it would be the next, the next son. So that was the high priest. Every time you see second priest in the Bible, it's talking about the deputy priest who would go in there and assist the high priest. Did I answer your question? Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. So, now, who knows who J. Vernon McGee is? All right, J. Vernon McGee was a Presbyterian pastor, theologian. He lived from 1904, died in 1988. Uh, made an observation. I was listening to a ser sermon of his on the high priest in the garments, and he made an observation that I'd never heard before. And, you know, it was interesting to me. He says... That the priest, um, the priest comes on behalf of man. A priest, uh, he, re he represents man before God. He brings man to God. A priest feels the same infirmities as a man because he is a man. The reason he does, the reason God appoints men to be high the high priest is so they can, they can have compassion on the ignorant. And they can feel the infirmities that we have. Okay? Turn to Hebrews 5 1. Hebrews 5 1. So for every high priest taken from among men, is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 2. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself is also encompassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So the high priest was a man, so he could... Uh, appointed by God, anointed by God to bring men's sins to God, to reconcile them to God. And he was a sinner himself, so he had to reconcile himself to God, and then he would. But him being a man, he could understand people's infirmities. He could be compassionate on them. Um, so this is one of the reasons that the Lord Jesus became a man, so he can have compassion on us and understand and realize our infirmity. So, now, a prophet is different than a priest in that a prophet is from God to man. You see? So, you read in the Old Testament all the time where the, the, all the prophets say, Thus saith the Lord. They are speaking as a representative of God to man. And this is a, a very great help to us as men uh, and women because we not only have a man who is... The Lord Jesus, who is representing us on behalf of man, but a prophet who is representing God to us. See, he fulfills both of those offices. And all the time through the Old Testament, you see where a priest runs into a prophet, they're always crossing paths. And in that, that middle portion right there, uh, it's, it's very good for man because you get both, both sides. So he, he pointed that out. I've never really heard it like that before. It was very interesting to me, so I figured I'd read it to you. But... Study on the garments, uh, you probably have to come up here to, to see these, but these are all the references, or some of the references that I've used throughout my study on the high priest. So Alfred Evershine, John Lightfoot, the rabbinical writings, uh, you have rabbinical Jews, um, the Talmud, which is their writing, the Mishnah, the commentary of the oral law, which we talked about, the Jewish and Christian compendium, we've talked about that, Jewish encyclopedia, uh, the scripture, 
Nave's top, topical Bible. Um, I showed this to a couple people I know. I got this at Lowry's, 10 bucks, 1902. And it, you can look up any word, and the word will um, it'll show you every single verse in the Bible for that word. So, it's a very good study tool. Now, you weren't here last, last week, sir, but I, I showed them uh, the seventh volume of the Treasury of David. Spurgeon bought it for 10 bucks at Lowry's, 1887. It was a gem. It was good. So I thought it was going to be around 100 bucks or something, but he said 10 bucks. He said, give me that. <laughs> so it was nice. But, and then uh, that book that I just read, A Scripture of History of the Jewish People and Its Republic. So these are just some of the references that I used. If you want to come write them down later, you can. Now, there are two types of priests in the Bible. Two types of priests. Can anybody name the two types of priests? Our high priest is one. High priest? So we talked about in the second temple time, uh, uh, the, the time of the second temple, um, that the priests were, it, it quit being hereditary. It quit being son to son to son, and they started buying the priesthood for political purposes. Remember that? So the priesthood is a little bit different in the times of the Lord Jesus um, because many of them weren't, Le you know, many of them weren't, weren't Levites. But it's interesting when you hear about the Temple Institute today and they're talking about uh, the priesthood. They call themselves Kohenites, right? Remember that word Kohen, which uh, means priest. And they say they take a DNA test nowadays to, to tell if they're a Kohenite. Uh, how effective that DNA test is, I don't know, because Jews have been spread all over the face of the earth. So it's kind of, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. But the selecting of the high priest, I just want to read this right quick out of the, the Mishnah, what the rabbinical oral text or the oral law says. Remember, we have a written law, which was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. And then you have what they say is the oral law uh, that came from Babylon. Babylon said that, uh, well, the rabbis, when they built the synagogues up there, they said that at the, at the foot of the mount, there were 70, 70 princes and the oral law was given to them right there at the mount. And this is the Mishnah. This is their commentary. On it. So, the high priest is chosen according. Uh, the high priest is chosen according to the Mishnah, commentary on the Torah. The Torah describes the high priest as the one who is the greatest from among his brethren. What defines his greatness? This has been interpreted as the greatness in piety, the awe of God, wisdom, handsomeness, wealth, uh, which, if necessary, is supplied to him, and strength. Though the ideal candidate for high priest has all these qualities, in fact. He should be greater than all his priestly brethren in all these areas. The two most important qualities are wisdom and piety. When a chief priest dies or retires, the natural heir to the position is his son. Or if he has no son, the next closest suitable heir, provided that the son is a truly pious individual. If he lacks Torah knowledge, he is provided a teacher to instruct him. If there is no son or heir, or if there is one, but he is not deemed worthy to assume his father's position. Then we seek the person most qualified based on the above criteria. Now who decides who the most qualified individual is and who determines whether the son is pious enough to assume the position of high priest? Some say that this responsibility lies in the hands of the Sanhedrin, the rabbinical Supreme Court that consists of 71 of the greatest sages of the day. We know all through the Old Testament when Jesus was here, our when Jesus was here, the Sanhedrin was there, right? The, the chief priest and the, um, the scribes. And others maintain that it was the king's responsibility to install a new high priest. Both the king and the Sanhedrin serve as representatives of the entire nation and as such are entitled to appoint the individual whose service in the temple is discharged on behalf of the entire nation. So what's interesting is you did have kings in that time 
that were appointed priests, political purposes, remember. And the Sanhedrin also had the power to say yea or nay for a person. But again, in the Lord Jesus' time, it was political. And before that, the first temple era, it was all hereditary that changed in that one. So, now, if we believe, because we're going to get into the garments here, if we believe what Isaiah 46.10 says, that God knows the beginning, or knows the end from the beginning, we'll see, as we start looking at the garments, that God has a purpose. Has a, a, I mean, it is to the, to the detail, the purpose. And I've seen some things in here that I was talking to Jonathan about that I've never seen before. And I'm not guaranteeing that you haven't seen it before, but it, is a, it was a big surprise to me, a good surprise. Because it was very interesting and I learned a lot from it. So God has determined everything from the beginning. And when I say that the garments, everything about the priestly garments and about their position, about the tabernacle was all symbolic. Everything was symbolic. And God did this on purpose and we're going to find out how he did it. So turn to Exodus 28. We'll get started on this. Exodus 28. I'm just going to read the first part of it here. Now, Exodus 28 is one of the uh, one of the passages in Scripture that reveals, or well, God starts telling Moses to um, to have the children of Israel start making garments for Aaron and his sons. Now, this is only one reference. I've wrote the references up here. If you want to come see them, we're not going to cover all of them, but you can go back and look at the real fine details there. So let's start at verse 1, chapter 28, verse 1. And take thou unto thee Aaron my, thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother. For glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me, unto the priest's office. And then it goes into the garments. Right? Now, garments themselves have a lot of meaning throughout the scripture. Elijah had a mantle, right? And when God took him, what happened? The mantle fell and it went to Elisha. And that mantle had power. John the Baptist, his clothing was different, right? <laughs> Everybody knew John the Baptist different. Um, so his clothing had meaning as well. The Lord Jesus' garment. People were trying to, for, for instance, the woman who had an issue with blood for 12 years. She wanted to, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed, right? And there was another time when he, they went across the Sea of Galilee into uh, Gennesaret, a town. And all the people came around and everybody who touched his garment were, it says, were holy, uh, were holy healed. Completely healed by touching his garment. So garments itself in the Bible, when we, if, you, if you go through the Bible and, and type in the word garment into your concordance, you'll go through and read and you'll see the garments have very significant meaning throughout the Bible. So, and also a man's clothing, uh, a man's clothing tells a lot about a man or a woman, right? So if I was to go out on the street and I was to see a, a man in uniform, I would assume that he's a police officer. Or if I was to go out and uh, go into a courthouse and see a man with a black robe, I would assume he's the judge, right? And so it's the same thing when it comes to the priest and the holy garments, it's the same exact thing. God designated specific garments holy garments to, to make the priest distinct from the rest of the children of Israel. Now, the word holy, if you look this up in your concordance, is Kadesh. That word Kadesh means separateness. 
apartness, or sacredness. God intended for the priests to be separate, completely separate from the children of Israel. And it was their clothing that separated them. Now, what's interesting, too, is if you read Edersheim's book, uh, The Temple and Its Ministries During the Time of Jesus Christ, it says that after the priests were done with their service for the week or for the day or however it was, they would take off their garments and they would walk around like everybody else and nobody would notice them as a priest. But then when it was time to go to work, they would put on the priestly garments and they were a priest. So that was the time of Jesus Christ. So, Exodus, what we just read right there, Exodus 28.3, it's interesting too that I, I'm going to say that God didn't trust man <laughs> to take his instruction and make the garments as what he wanted them to be. So what did he do? He says, and you shall speak unto all those who are wise hearted, whom I have filled with my spirit, the spirit of wisdom to make the garments. God fills them with the spirit to make the garments exactly how he wants them because God has a plan from the beginning. These garments are supposed to be a certain way and they, they get fulfilled in the New Testament. Another interesting thing is, is they're seamless. All right. The priest garment are seamless. The only thing when we think about seam, seamless, I mean, they're woven. Anybody know how to weave? <laughs> weave. Or you have sewing, right? Weaving, knitting, this kind of thing. Everybody else's clothes back then were sewn. They, were, they, had, they had a seam right here. There was different parts that they connected together. Down here, there were seams. The priestly garment was one piece woven. The only thing that had a seam was the sleeve. That's it. All right? But this part right here all the way down was one piece. One woven piece. And you can see that. I wrote the verses up there. You can see that. Now, I want you to, I want you to see the passage of scripture here that a lot of people overlook when they're reading the gospels. All right. Look at John 19, 23. John 19, 23. Now there's a prophecy in Psalm 22 where David speaks Of the Lord Jesus' garment being, ca they're casting lots for, for his garment, right? So the soldiers are casting garment or lots for his garment. I want to read this for you. 1923. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts. Now, the four parts is interesting as well. It is a, it's a fulfillment of a symbol of the priest, priestly garments as well. We're going to go on that, into that later. Uh, four parts to every soldier and also his coat. Now, the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Now, what's interesting about this is where did the Lord Jesus get this woven coat from? You ever thought about that? Now, I mean, a lot of people look at the scripture and they just read it and it's just, they just read through it. But where did the Lord Jesus get this priestly, one piece, woven, seamless coat? Where did he get it from? The Bible doesn't say where he got it from. But either, I mean, he, either he acquired it from somewhere or somebody gave it to him for this specific purpose. But what it shows, because there was only one group of people who wore woven, seamless clothes, and that was the priesthood. That's showing right there in that passage that he is a priest, which is very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So, now the tabernacle... Now we're gonna go. We're gonna go right. We're gonna go back and forth. All right. So right here we see that priest. He, he is wearing priestly garments. They take it off of him, 
and they start casting lots for a four piece, but the coat itself, they didn't, they didn't rend, and you'll see that in a minute, they didn't tear it. But, now we're gonna go back. So the tabernacle, in the tabernacle, with the priests, we know that when the children of Israel would come to offer a sacrifice, they would come into the court, and they would bring their whatever animal was for whatever whatever sin or whatever offering. And it was the priests in their priestly garments that handled the animal, they handled the blood, they handled the oil, right, for the menorah, they handled all these things. Now, if you read a, a lot of the, the rabbinical writings, the Talmud, the compendium, all these things, and you start putting things together, you'll see that the priestly garments, and I want to, I just want to touch on them right quick. The priestly garments were breeches, white, pure white breeches that went from the waist to the knee. There was a woven coat that went one piece all the way down. There was a girdle, and then there was a mitre or a bonnet. All right? That and were, everything was pure white. This is what the priest wore every time they were in the service of God. All right? So as they were in there, they were handling blood and olive oil, and there was, you know, they were in the desert. They were in, you know, dust and all this kind of thing. So they had to be really careful when they were tending to these things, the sacrifices and such. Now, the priest did not, when the garment got dirty, they did not wash it. They did not wash it. What they would do is they would be very careful, and it, the, the garments would last a while. But after it got worn out, what they would do was get rid of them. They would destroy them. And then they would get a new garment. But they didn't throw them away when they got done with them. What they would do is they would cut them into strips. And this, this I mean, this part of history I've never heard. It's not, it's not in the Word of God. But you can um, you go back and look at these, look at the history. They would cut these things into strips. And there would be different things that they would do with them. All right? Remember, this is a worn priestly garment. One of the main things they would do is, we all know what this is. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sketchy drawer, okay? Let me, <laughs> let me just warn you right now. <laughs> all right, we had a bowl on top, right? We all know what this is, right? Menorah. This is the menorah. All right. So back in, back in, back in the day, uh, the, Oh, the tabernacle days, they didn't have candles, all right? So they used lamps, they used lamps. And so there was a wick in each one of these, right? And the wick was covered with oil, olive oil. Now, one of the purposes for these priestly garments, when they cut them into strips, was to make wicks, all right? And so they would put the wick in, they would take these things and they twist them and they put them in there and then they put the olive oil on them and then they light it. And this is how they kept the menorah a lit. Now this has a picture. This is a picture, all right? Now watch this picture. The menorah is a picture of the light of the gospel. All right? You remember when we were talking about the tabernacle? The tabernacle being the holy place, being the spiritual kingdom of God. When you enter in after sanctification, you know, sanctification is a process where washing and you're going in, but as you enter into the, the, the holy place, the kingdom of God, there's illumination, there's feeding, the bread, the showbread, there's intercession by the Lord Jesus. All that happens right there in the holy place. Well, this right here is a picture of the gospel, the burning light of the gospel. All right. Now, every time you see oil in the Old Testament, all right, when the priest is getting anointed, they pour oil over his head and he runs down his beard. David talks about, maybe he had a beard like mine, I don't know. But pours over his beard. That is a picture of the Holy Spirit being, that's a picture of the Holy Spirit, all right? And we remember that the new covenant says that God says, I will put my spirit in them. Back in that day, the spirit was upon them. It was on them, <coughs> and that was a picture. So we have the oil, we have the wick. And well, we have the menorah, the light of the gospel, we have the Holy Spirit, and now we have the wick of the worn garments of the priest. Here's the picture. The light of the gospel cannot shine 
through the Holy Spirit, without the priest wearing out his garment in service to God. How that plays with us is 1 Peter 2 9. Let's turn that real quick. 1 Peter 2 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of peculiar people, that ye show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who is that talking about? Who? Who is the holy priesthood? The believers, right? So the entire Levitical priesthood system and their garments is a picture of the believer, right? The believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse, look at verse 5. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are spiritually wearing holy garments. We are separate. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we are separate. But the light of the gospel cannot burn within us through the Holy Spirit if our, if our holy garments in the service of the Lord are not being wore out. You see that? It's not saying, it's doing. We have to obey. We have to do. People can say they're Christian all day long, and I want to give you an example. I have never in my life talked to a Jehovah's Witness. Never. And I got the opportunity two days ago, three days ago, and I talked to him for six hours. Six hours. One of the night he works with me, one of the nicest people I've ever met. I mean, but when we started talking about the Bible, and we started talking about what a Christian is, and we started talking about what the message is, we started talking about these things. We found out real quick, I found out real quick, that a Jehovah's Witness. It's impossible for them to be a Christian. It's impossible. Um, and the conversation ended with a question that I had. And I tell you now, the, the conversation was at, was at a dead end. But I was preaching the gospel to this guy. And I was, we were going through. And, and he actually let me go through scripture and scripture and scripture with him. Awesome. You know? so, and a lot, of people, a lot of them won't let you do that. They just kind of abruptly stop you from what I've heard. And I've done a lot of research over the years over Jehovah's Witnesses. And I finally got the opportunity to talk to one. And it was a good conversation. It wasn't mean or anything or, you know, uh, I wasn't. But I did tell him that I fear for him. I fear for him. And the reason I fear for him is because I asked him what his message was. When you go around preaching to people, when you go to knocking on people's doors, what is your message? What's the overall message? And I told him, by what I'm preaching to you now. Am I on my way to annihilation? They don't believe in hell. They believe that you're going to get cast and they're going to be annihilated, destroyed forever. And he told me, yes, what you're preaching right now, that Jesus, the Lord Jesus is God Almighty, and that, you know, he was incarnate and all these things. They don't believe that. And so he told me that I was on my way to annihilation. And I said, then what do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do to have eternal life? And the, the conversation went silent. I'm going to tell you right now, the conversation was almost dead. And God put that in my mind. I believe that wholeheartedly. Ask this man, what is it going to take for me to be saved? Mm -hmm. What's it going to take? And he could not answer me. The, the next response was, Robbie, I got to go. It's been a good conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> But anyway, uh, we were talking about the 144,000. Yep. That's them that's going to be saved in the end in Revelation. Right. She thinks. But I asked her to pray for my grandson when he was in Iraq. She said, we don't do that. And I said, what do you mean you don't do that? She said, well, we don't believe in the government. And I said, then why are you yep. going to get commodities? Yep. I said, those come from the government. 
And I said, God said to pray about everything and everyone. And uh, she said, well, we don't believe in war, so we don't pray for soldiers. And I yep. said, well, I feel sorry for you. Yep. I mean, it was a, we went into everything. We went into everything. And to tell you the truth, at the end of the, because I've never talked to one before, I was, I was literally almost in tears because mm -hmm. talking to him and, and he saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I, I, you know, and just listening to him talk. And I'm sitting there going, man, I, I fear for you. But the point of that was, is that Jehovah's Witnesses work. They work. Yeah. Mormons, they work. But all the, the Bible talks about dead works. It's dead works without Jesus. Yes. We need to give a minute. You know, you're right. You're, you're right on because they're very zealous. But it's because most of them feel they're not probably going to make it to, the, to heaven. Yes. Absolutely. But they're trying to live forever on earth. Right. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about that is, um, and I've had one serious conversation, but I was about 20 years old then. Uh, he came to our college dorm. We spent a couple of hours talking, yep. and um, they they literally take the number one hundred forty four thousand. They take it literally. They do, but it's figurative when they decide who they are because right. it tells us that they're single male Jews. Yep, and then they say it's figurative, which of course I have a my belief is after the church is finished it, with its work with the ministry. The 144,000 single male Jews are the ones that are going to propagate the gospel. That's what I believe. Right. But um, and, and it is true we get a new heaven, new earth, and we're going to be there. But of course, the means is very different. But yes. that's the thing, and they're very zealous, very, because they're trying to get themselves into the new earth. Don't think they're going to get to heaven. Right. Absolutely. And we discussed that. They don't even shoot for heaven. Because, they, because they, well, I, I, I be asked him if he was a part of the 144,000. He said, oh, well, not Yeah, me. they've picked you know, a lot kind of, of them already, if not all. And yeah. some of them are women. Yeah, so, that's the problem. That's why they, they take the scriptures. But, of course, in their bylaws, they will admit they're, they have to change their doctrine at the time. And they right. do, they quite do. a bit. I, I did a, I did, I've done a study on Charles Taze Russell. The, the, you know, he, they fit it. And I went to the Greek with him about them adding... You know, the indefinite article with a God and all this yeah, kind of stuff. Right, yeah. They add it to the Greek language. So, but a Jehovah's Witness is always going to go back to the verse that he's, that he's you know, that he's good so, at. Yeah. You know, and yeah. he'll continue to go that. Or the line that I've heard over and over and over. This is not a study on Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way. But <laughs> the, the line that I got over and over and over was, that's your interpretation. Mm -hmm. It was just over and over and over. So, but anyways, to get back to this. Um, they're, the works that they do is zealous works, but the Bible talks about dead works. They're dead because they have nothing to do with the Lord Jesus. Nothing. That's right. So they are not the royal priesthood. Those who are of the royal priesthood have faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the light of the gospel burns in them through the Holy Spirit with their works, with the works that they do through the Lord God. You know, if it was up to us and up to our flesh, we wouldn't do anything for God. God does it through us, that's right? right? That's right. So that's why they are, we are, it, it will be unto good works because they will be from God. So that's an interesting picture, right? Mm -hmm. the, the garments are shredded. Mm -hmm. They're made into wigs. And that represents the, the, the worn out garments of the service of God being lit on, being soaked with the Holy Spirit and being lit with the light of the gospel. It's, it's awesome. Yes. I have a question along the line. Yes. But these uh, Baptist people that believe that you women should wear dresses all the time and men should wear suits to church and, you know, is that, I mean, I know it's kind of fundamental, but is this along the line of where they get that information along the royal priesthood of holy nation and all of this other stuff that we're learning about tonight that, you know, as godly people we're supposed to represent God so we're supposed to dress appropriately and you know wearing uh, women wearing jeans is not being appropriate and all that stuff I, I can help you yeah. um, do you mind? no sir uh, the uh, in the case of the women and their clothing their primary verses are from the Old Testament where a woman should not wear that which pertains to a man however in the Hebrew and that's referring to military God. And uh, it's, 
even those who are very strict with it have to revert to a cultural uh, atmosphere because the men back in those days didn't wear pants like we wear them. Uh, they had different kinds of clothing, and so they they'll say, admit it, it was a cultural thing. Well, the truth is our culture has also changed as well. Mm -hmm. But the scriptures never tell us, tell them, say what they wanted to say. And, uh, and for years in our own country, it was very culturally acceptable, for instance, for men to wear suits at churches. But remember, they used to wear suits to baseball games. Mm -hmm. I remember back in my day, we still dressed up in a suit and tied, or a sport coat and tied, even fly in the airplane. Uh, you know, it was always a dress up type thing, but culture has definitely changed. Mm -hmm. But they struggle with that because they just can't get around it. And so they, they revert back to it. So that's where we where it's from. You know, um, well, I was reading here in First Timothy, it talks about women in being in modest apparel, you know. And, but I don't think jeans is not modest, you know, unless you're doing it for a purpose to right. make men look at you, you know what I mean? That's, so, and the culture has changed, I agree with you. Um, but you, I, I'll, I'll say this, you get a lot of groups, religious groups, that dress the way they dress because they believe that it's a righteous thing before God. It's a work. Yeah. They, they, I wear dresses and no makeup because I feel like God, I'm, God is pleased by this. And that's not to say that God's not pleased by that. Right. I mean, he, he said to dress modestly. But when it becomes that, when it becomes I'm doing this work because, uh, let's, say, let's say a Jehovah's Witness does not have the Lord Jesus, that's a dead work. It is. I mean, you can, you can dress nice your whole life, but it means nothing if you don't have him. As far as, the, as far as the royal priesthood goes and the garments and things like that, all this is symbolic. We are a, a royal priesthood. We are the priests. We are, uh, the believers are the priests. And so when, I, when I'm talking about wearing our, our garments, that means into service of the Lord. You know, and that's the picture of that is back then when they were, you know, okay. offering the sacrifices and things like that. Here's another thing. <coughs> it aroused my attention. I tried to find it, and I did it because this is for the moment, but I've read it so many times. It's probably in Leviticus because that's where this is dealt with most of the time. Mm -hmm. The high priest could only serve in that capacity of the blood sacrifice, the sacrifices for 20 years, ages 30 to 50. And he had to be, you talked about requirements, uh, and you read some of those. He couldn't have a blemish on him. Yep. I mean, yeah, he, uh, it was very, there were very few who ever qualified physically, let alone you know, spiritually, to be a high priest. And, uh, you know, it was, it's very impressive to me because, of course, that goes along with the sacrifices they had to be without blemish. And that's our Redeemer as well, without right. blemish. And, uh, you know, everything is just, you know, a, for, a, a precursor to what Jesus Christ was. Yep. And uh, that's where Leviticus to me is so exciting because it just has every law that you could ever imagine that our Lord God has given. And some of those are given in Exodus, but boy, the details are in Leviticus. Right. If a person approaches Leviticus from that standpoint, then it's an interesting book. Absolutely. And if they don't, then they're bored to <laughs> Right. It's, it's hard to chew on. Right, it is. It's very, I mean, Genesis all the way through, I mean, the first five books of the Bible is very hard to chew on. Yeah. But if you look at it from the end, yeah. and you go back, backwards, like, you know, what yeah. we're doing right now. The believer is the priest. Now go back and look at what they were doing, and it just, it opens up. Here's another interesting thing. We remember, I mean, we're, we're coming up on Christmas time. We're going to talk about swaddling clothes, right? Mm -hmm. Swaddling clothes. Turn to Luke 2 right quick. Here's another picture. I've never seen before. Luke 2, verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
The second thing that the priest would do with their worn out garments is they would, so the first was the wigs, they would make wigs, but there were a bunch of priests, right? And their garments were getting worn out. The second thing they would do is send their priest to Bethlehem. They would send these worn out garments to Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem, there were certain pastors outside the city of Bethlehem, which Bethlehem is right south of Jerusalem. It's, it's right next to it, south. There were certain pastors that raised the lambs for the sacrifices every year at Passover. They were bred specifically for the sacrifices. And in these pastors, in all these pastures, they had stables. And in the stables were hanging these straps, the priestly straps. So what would happen is, is when a baby lamb was born, they would wrap this lamb in those priestly garments to keep it warm. This is where we get the Lamb of God. In Bethlehem, in Micah 2, prophecy says that Bethlehem is going, you Bethlehem are the smallest of all the cities, but out of you is going to come a ruler out of Bethlehem. So Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Mary brings forth her firstborn son in a stable. Could God have orchestrated it where it would have been nice and cozy, where there was a room in the inn and they would have went in there and she would have had the baby? Absolutely. But because he is the Lamb of God, which John the Baptist claimed, he was born in the stable, he was put in a manger, and he was wrapped with the same garments, the swaddling clothes that a baby lamb was wrapped with. Now here's what's interesting. We talked about this one time. Is a king born? Or is a prince born? Prince. A prince. A king is not at one time in history has a king ever been born. It's always princes. But everybody called him the king of the Jews. Right? Ever since he was born, the king of the Jews. And now we see ever since he was born, he was wrapped in priestly garments. And he is from birth a priest. I have never seen that before. And that is amazing. Yeah. Is it not? Now the word swaddling clothes, you look up in your, in your concordance. You know, I mean, the concordance is amazing, by the way. I mean, it's, you know, when you, once you start seeing stuff like this and you start looking words up, you go, man, it's been there the whole time and I've never. Sparganeo, that's the word. It means to wrap with strips. <laughs> wow. That all ties in, don't it? Yeah. Perfect. Perfectly ties in. He was likened to the sacrificial lamb born in Bethlehem. What's also interesting about Bethlehem, who knows what Bethlehem means? What is it? Close. What's it? House of God. Anybody know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. House of bread. Bread. Yes, sir. Who's the bread from heaven? <laughs> it's his house. It's amazing, right? Now, so that's a little bit about the regular priest's garments and what they did with their garments, right? We're not even getting into the symbolism and all the all that stuff yet. We're introducing just some of the stuff about them. This is how deep this goes. So the high priest garment. Let's go to the high priest right quick. Who knows? Who's ever heard of the golden vestments? Golden vestments? All right, so let's look at this. The difference between these two men is one is a regular priest and one is the high priest. Just like the pastor said, there was one high priest. He had to be from 30. He would run from 20 years, 30 to 50. And what he's got on right here is he's got on an ephod, an ephod, which is like an apron, and he's got a breastplate. Uh, he's got four different golden vestments that he adds on top of his regular vestments, the four white. So he's got the white under, and then on top he's got the four. Now, he would only use these four golden vestments on the Day of Atonement. In the service of the Lord, he would, they would be using these, they would be in there, and they would be doing the things, but... When he went into the holy of the most holy place, the holy of holies, he 
would take those gold investments off, and he would have his regular, uh, he would have his regular priestly garments on, and he would even change his mitre. He would change his mitre, he would take it off and put a bonnet on. So he was going in there the same as a regular priest, confessing his sins and confessing the sins of all the people, or sacrificing for them with a scapegoat and things like that. Now we're going we're gonna to talk about the vestments and what all that means, but later, right now, um, we're going to talk about the same thing that we were talking about with the other priest. What does he do with his garments once they're, once they're old? What does a high priest do with his garments? A high priest was not allowed to destroy the vestments, these right here. They were not allowed to destroy them. What, what, they, what they would do is when they got worn out, they would hide them in a secret place where nobody else knew. And they were not ever allowed to be used again. That's what would happen. So, turn to John again. John 19. Let's see another picture here. Now, all throughout the Bible, we see the Jewish culture, and before that, Job, rending their garments, tearing their garments. Do we remember this? What does that mean? What does it mean when a person tears their garments? What, what are they feeling? Grief. Grief. Right? So, heartbreak, you know, grief, things Sorry. like that. It's a grievance. It's a, somebody died. Or, um, there's a couple of passages of scripture. You know, uh, Jacob rent his garment when he found Zion. When, when his sons tell him that Joseph is dead, he rents his garments in Genesis. David rents his garment when he finds out that King Saul has been killed in, in 2 Samuel. And then Job, in Job 1, he, he rents his mantle when he finds out that his children have been killed. All right? So, obviously, it's an important thing in the Bible. It's, it is a picture. All right? It's a picture. And the thing about the high priest was they were forbidden to rend their garments. Their garments. They could not do it. The reason they could not do it is because it, if they did it, it was a sign that they were done with their ministry. They were done. It would end their high priestly ministry if they rent their garments. All right? Here's the picture. Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. We've seen that's priestly garment. Then they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, Who it uh, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they parted by raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. What did they not do? They did not Tear the coat, the woven coat. Why? Because that would have undone his priesthood, his high priesthood. But it was prophesied that they wouldn't. Yeah. And that shows you right there that he is the high priest. Now, here's what's interesting too. Caiaphas. Remember Caiaphas. Who was Caiaphas? The high priest. He is the high priest at the time of Jesus. Yeah. Let's turn to Matthew 26. When I tell you that God had it all planned out. And you have to read the details in Scripture. And if you do not, you're going to miss it. You are going to miss it. All right? Matthew 26, verse 63. I want you to watch what happens here. Verse 63. But Jesus, this is when the, the high priest that took him at night, which was illegal, they arrested him. They took him at night. And they bring him in in front of the, the high priest and the, the council. And they bring false witness against him. All right? And it says, but Jesus, in verse 63, held his peace 
And the high priest answered, the high priest Caiaphas said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that you tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Watch this. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. What the high priest do? Rent his clothes. You know what this is a picture of? The Levitical priesthood ending and the spiritual priesthood beginning. Caiaphas, if you don't know, in John 11, if it was, I believe it was God speaking through him, prophesied that Jesus was going to die. He was going to be the man that dies for the nation and not only the nation, but all the scattered people. He prophesied that. Why would the high priest prophesy that? He, I, he was speaking truth, but I don't even know if he realized what he was speaking. I think God put that in his mouth. This as well. This as well. The high priest was not allowed to rent his garment, but he did it because he was so appalled about what Jesus was saying. And Jesus also told him, you see where he says, thou hast said. I didn't say it. You said it. Caiaphas, you have said. You see what I mean? So Caiaphas is actually rent. He is actually... Accepting the fact that Jesus is the high priest with his action by rending, rending his garment. Now, yes. Um, I'm just wondering where I can find uh, that the high priest isn't allowed to rent his clothes. Edershon talks about it. Okay. Alfred Edershon. Lightfoot talks about it. Uh, the Talmud talks about it. You can go on the. These, if you go right here, just copy these down and right. go research that. Google, you can type it in Google, but you're not going to get a whole lot out of Google. Well, it's just historical, not necessarily. Yeah. Okay. Right, it's a historical thing. Yeah. <coughs> um, so, the rending of the garment is very, it's very telling. Not only when, she, when the Lord Jesus is on the cross and there, the prophecy in Psalm, uh, Psalms 22, but the soldiers not rending that garment lets you know that he's the high priest and Caiaphas renting his garment lets you know that there's an ending that's about to take place of the old, old way and, and he is the new way. So now, the hem of the garment. We talked a little bit ago about the woman who had an issue with blood and there was a crowd around Jesus and she was trying to get through and she said, if only I could just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And then the man at Gennesaret, the people at Gennesaret, they bring all their diseased and sick, and they touched his clothes, and they were healed, wholly healed. Now, turn to Numbers 15 right quick. Numbers 15. If you haven't learned through almost a year or so of Bible study that we've been studying, the Bible is a puzzle that you need to put together. God has to lead you into putting these things together. And it's a, it is probably the greatest mathematical problem that has ever existed on the face of the earth. This is a mathematical problem. And things add up. If you put them together, they all add up. All right, yes. Can I, can I share this with you? Yes. I like it when you tell us what you're going to be on the next week so we can study it. Yes. I was on it two and a half hours or so, and I sat at my kitchen table, and it was just like God said, all of a sudden I just stopped, and I mean, I'm going through all of this, scriptures and verses, and all of a sudden it was just like God said, it's all me. So I sat there without even thinking, and I said, this all comes down to God, pure, consecrated, sacrificed, high priest, king, anointed one, the Christ, reverence to the Lord, our priest Jesus Christ. I mean, it was just like out of the clear blue sky. I mean, he stopped me. Awesome. And I just wrote these down, you know? He said, it's me. I mean, it was just amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Very good. So Numbers 15 talks about the Lord God telling the children of Israel to put tassels on their garments. All right? Look at, look at verse uh, 37. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them. And that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, which after which you used to go a whoring. So God tells them to put these fringes or or tassels, right, on the hem of their garment at the bottom. And the high priest also has something on the on the bottom of the ephod there, on the hem. He, we're going to go over that when he has pomegranates and bells and things like this on his on his vestments. But God tells him to put these these uh, these tassels on there, and he says, "Run a ribbon of glue in each one." Right? And and some tradition says that there's sixteen hundred and thirty or six hundred and thirteen of the the tassels running around their garment to to remind them of the the law, all the laws that they have of God. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but. There's a ribbon of blue in each one of the tassels. And as the children of Israel are looking at the clothes that they're wearing, that blue ribbon is supposed to remind them of the commandments of God. That's the whole purpose, all right? Now, I want to say something that's kind of out there, all right? But if you think about Revelation, and you think about the beast, and the woman riding the beast, and it talks about Mystery Babylon, if you look at the colors, it's purple, scarlet, and gold. And blue in the book of Numbers, God's talking about. But if you look at Revelation, it's scarlet, purple, and gold. The blue is missing. The blue is the reminder of the commandments of God. If everybody, if, if the interpretation is that the woman is a church system riding a beast governmental system, like the Roman Empire in the Inquisition, right, where they controlled the government, and they had they hung over their heads, you know, if you don't do these things for us, if you don't do our bidding, then you are not going to be able to do the sacraments and you can't be saved. That's sort of like what it sounds like, right? So it would be if the woman is the, a church and the beast is a government, that the church is controlling the government. And if the color blue is missing, it's a church that does not adhere to the commandments of God. Very interesting, right? That's a good one. And what's interesting as well is if you can go back and look at this too. Why is the color blue used to remind them of the commandments of God? In Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 1 talks about, well, let's turn there real quick. We'll, we'll go off. We'll go off here in a second. <laughs> now, I'm not dogmatic about this. I'm not. But think about it. Look at verse 26. So this is describing God's glory right here. I mean, it's describing God on his throne and, and all the things that are around him and the, the colors and all these things and, and the, the, the cherubim and all this. And so verse 26, it talks about the firmament. And about the firmament that was over their heads, which is talk about the cherubim that are, that are carrying the throne, uh, was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. And as the appearance of a sapphire stone. What color is sapphire? Blue. Blue. So, I want you to think about this. Who wrote the, who, who made the movie The Ten Commandments? Uh, Cecil B. DeVille. Right? When he came, comes down from the mountain, and he's got these two stones in his hands. The question is, do they really know what the stones look like? Or is that just a depiction of what they look like? Because right here, it says that the firmament that's up under God, right? I mean, right there, his part of his throne is made of sapphire stone, blue. And if God is telling the children of Israel to make a, make a thing of blue so you, it will remind you of my commandments, is it possible that the stones that God cut into the law that cut the law into wrote with his finger into were the stones sapphire were they blue to 
get them to remind the children of Israel. You see what I mean? When they look at that, they say, we know exactly what that is. Yeah. Okay. It's just an I'm, I'm not dogmatic about that. I'm just saying it's an interesting <laughs> point to think about and look at. <laughs> so. Something to check out. It is. Check it out. Don't check me out on it. Just check that out because I don't. <laughs> so. Um, Isaiah 6 1. Let's turn there right quick. Isaiah 6 1. I hope you like scripture. Because I do. I think man thinks too much. We think and we believe too much. Well, I believe this, or I think this, or my opinion is this. Or the Bible tells us, I think the preacher said it one time, ain't it, ain't it good that God does the thinking for us, right? So. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1, Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, the word train in the Hebrew is a word called shul. Shul. Right there. Show the meaning right here. It means the skirt of a robe. High priest robe. Sorry. Oh, and the root word for this means it's it's in the concordance it said it's an unused root word, but the root word is to hang down. The train, the, the God, His train filled the temple. Right? In the Greek, uh, it's doxa. The word doxa there. Well, I wrote it wrong. This goes here. But the word doxa comes from the word diguo. And that means to expose to the eyes. Expose to the eyes. And I want you to see how everything ties together here. Hebrew custom says that the veil of the temple... The place, the, the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place in the temple, in the tabernacle, was called the hem of God's garment. All right? The hem of God's garment. That's what Hebrew, Hebrew custom says. Now, if you look at this right here and the meanings there, this shows that God was trying to expose something to the eye of the Jew. When Jesus was crucified, there was an earthquake, the rocks rent, and what else rent? The curtain. The curtain. The veil, yeah. Right, the veil. This word doxa means exposed to the eyes. Now, I want to read something for you. I'm going to tie this in. There's a book called The Jewish Book of Why. It's, it's written by Jonathan David Publishing. And there's a section in there called, Why Do Mourners Tear Their Garments Before the Funeral? Right? Why do mourners tear their garments before the funeral? This is Jewish history. Basically, it says this. The reason they did that before the funeral, well, let's, let's tie it in with this first. God is trying to expose to the eyes once the veil tears in Hebrew custom, in Hebrew custom, it's the hem of his garment. God is trying to expose to the Jews who the priests were in the temple at the time when Jesus was crucified because it was Passover time, was it not? They were serving in the temple. Mm -hmm. When that rent... If we look in the Old Testament, rending is what? The veil is the hem of God's garment. When his son dies on the cross, the veil rents from top to bottom. Which is, This is how a Jew would do it. Right? Mm -hmm. From top to bottom. Mm -hmm. That is a picture. And Jews would have understood that. Jewish priests would have understood that God, if his train fills the temple, and he is the one who dwells in the temple, mm -hmm. God is renting his garment. Yeah. For the death of his son. Yeah. That's one picture. Another picture, of course, is the veil and everything opening up to the believer, mm -hmm. being able to come to the throne of God. 
without the, without the priest. Um, but it's a very interesting thing right there. Now, John 2.19, turn there real quick. You notice too, uh, it, it slips my mind about the, the Jonathan David, um, why they did it before the funeral. But he goes on this, this uh, couple sentence um, excerpt there where he talks about why they rent their garment before the funeral. And the words are slipping me right now, but it's interesting that the veil was rent before the burial, right? I mean, it goes right along with Jewish, the, the Jewish way. So, John 2, 19. What does Jesus say here? Destroy the temple in three days on our second. Yes. This is another picture. This is another picture. He is prophesying. He is telling them that the temple that you worship God in is not the true temple. The temple is the body. We, you know, the temple, our body is the temple of God. And Jesus is ushering in the new royal priesthood and him being the high priest. The Levitical priests don't understand. They're saying, what is this? It took 42 years to, to build this thing. You're telling me you're going to tear it down? How are you going to build it up in three days? They had no idea. No clue what he was talking about. What he was talking about was the spiritual temple. It talks about that in Acts 7 as well. But, so, the veil, the Lord Jesus, the garments, the rending of the high priest garments, the soldiers not rending his coat, all these things are exposing that the Jewish system was over, the original was done, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't even in the second temple, it was not even there. Which, that's where the throne of God was. You know? um, there was no longer a physical high priest, like Caiaphas was, mm -hmm. a Levitical high priest. It was a spiritual. And in the next 40 years, the temple would be destroyed and the sacrifices would be ceased. Would they not? Mm -hmm. In 70 AD, everything was done. Yeah. So are garments important? Absolutely. I just looked at Southway. Yes. About the garment. Okay. And they said that it's because it's a two sided type thing versus death and loss, and that's why a week of mourning and, and um, intense mourning, and then for a year of mourning, intense sorrow, and then a year of mourning. Okay. But the other is that they feel that since they believe since their souls exist before they were in the body, that they continue to be with them afterward, even though they themselves can't observe them, but they can be observed by the souls. That's what this part that you said here. Wow. So I, I don't know. I, I was thinking they would have been talking about some everlasting life thing, but they didn't. Right. At least not in this one I read. Wow. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. You know, it, it, details are important, are they not? Yeah. We've seen that details are very important. I mean, word, every word is important. And you can see after the, death, after the death of the Lord and his burial, that things start coming unhinged. They start coming unraveled. You know, uh, they start being exposed. The priests know who he is, even though they're not telling them that. Because there's people who come up and say, you know, uh, the body's gone. The body's gone. And what do the priests do? Well, I'll pay you money to be quiet. You know what I mean? They, there's a lot of things that are happening that you can tell, that they can tell that things are unraveling. And so... The study's over tonight, but I just want to enhance uh, the importance as we do our study of looking forward and then gathering the picture in the New Testament and then going backwards, realizing that we are the priesthood, the believers, and seeing the things that were happening to Jesus is why it's very important to read the Gospels when it comes to his life. This is why it's important as well. Like the Jehovah's Witness told me, I don't ever go outside the Bible to read anything outside the Bible. And I told him, 
You know what? There's nothing wrong with that. Everything you need spiritually is in the Bible. But if you want to understand a lot of things about a lot of things, you go outside and learn the history of the Jewish people, and you'll see that a lot of the things that Jesus was, there's idioms in there. There's a lot of things that he's saying that are purely Jewish. They're purely Jewish. And for you to understand them, um, like for instance, I'll, I'll just give you an instance. Timothy, or Paul tells Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. All right? And this Jehovah's Witness, I, when I asked him what message does he preach, he said, I preach what Jesus told us to preach, the gospel of the kingdom. And I said, you've you got to understand something. All right? There was a certain people group that Jesus was talking to. We learn lessons from every word out of the word of God. But Jesus says... Don't cast your pearl to the swine. You don't preach to the Gentiles. You keep it in the house of Israel. Right? That's who he's telling. And he's telling them to preach that the kingdom is at hand. Well, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, we can do a study on that. They are parallel kingdoms. They run side by side, but they're not the same. And I don't believe they're the same because the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is taken over by force and violence. And the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, but it's within you. And so they are preaching the kingdom of heaven, which is an earthly kingdom. And they're telling everybody about earth. I'm preaching the kingdom of God and telling them that you must be born again. You can't see the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, where you will be a royal priest if you are born again. You see? So, this study right here not only helped me with talking to a Jehovah's Witness, but it also is, we're going to continue on and learn about the garments, and it also shows me a little bit more into who, who the Lord Jesus is. We can talk all day about him being the high priest. We can say, he's our high priest. What does that mean? What is exactly does that mean? Because you're not a Jew, and... You have no idea about the Levitical priesthood and, and, and the sacrifices and things like that. So how does it apply to us as believers? Well, it all points to us, every bit of it. But God, what we need to do is pray that God shows us these things in Leviticus and Exodus and Numbers. How do these things apply to us? And use the history and put it all together. And it comes out looking somewhat like this. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, uh, it's not the best that, that it can be, but... Uh, I learned a good bit from it. I hope you did too. And we're going to continue on to go through the symbology of the, the vestments. Uh, yes. What you said about us being the church, I just got to thinking of what I read the other day in Second Chronicles. Since Solomon could build a dwelling place for God because, because God could never be contained with any physical structure, the temple provides a place for God's people to go and offer sacrifice of worship to the Lord. Mm. Back in the Old Testament again. You know, so the, the Bible is clear that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Mm -hmm. And I want you to go back, if you want to do this, just go back and look at the temples that were built for God. David said, I want to build you a temple. Why did David do that? Did God tell him to do that? No. He said, I live in this big, huge palace. I need to build God something even bigger than what I live in. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Every one of the temples, Herod, when he built the temple, rebuilt it. Of course, that wasn't for God. The temples that were made with, for the Levitical priests to, to, make, to make sacrifices to God were never of God. They were never ordained by God to build them. He allowed it. God has a permissive will. He allowed it to happen because there were people coming in there with soft hearts. Really, you know, God talks about the sacrifices of God are the uh, contrite spirit and the broken heart, right? Or is that backwards? Broken contrite spirit. Broken contrite spirit. So if you were bringing a, a sacrifice uh, for a sin offering and you really didn't feel remorse for it, it meant nothing. Right. You see? It meant nothing. So, and that was the majority of the people. They were just doing it because it was a ritual thing they had to do. They said, God told us to do this, so we're going to do it. It had nothing to do with repentance. That probably exists today, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Uh, you can find in the New Testament what the sacrifices of God are. They're not animals. Um, but are there any questions over what we went over tonight? Yes, ma'am. I have a comment. Okay. You're talking about grief. This, that's really important. Uh, it really struck me because uh, a couple a 
couple times I had several people in my family that died very close together. And I remember the first month was horrible. I didn't think I was ever going to get through it. The first year was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. But after the first year, it was like my heart softened and I was able to get on. But I didn't think I was going to get through that first year because it was horrible. It was really hard. So when, when Pastor said what he did about grief, I can only understand that. Right. And that's really true. You know, um, the thing about Christians, and the Bible's clear when it, when it says in, in, in 1 Thessalonians that, and I'm paraphrasing here, that our sorrow for those brothers and sisters who are Christian should not be the same sorrow as those that of the world, right? right. So we are going to grieve. There's going to be grief, obviously. If, if the Hebrew custom is right, the hem of God's garment, and, and he grieved over his son, of course, you know, um, there's going to be grief when people leave because we're going to miss them, you know. But they're Christian, and we know where they're at. Okay. And so there shouldn't be a whole lot of time that we're grieving. There should be, there should be, there's going to be grieving, but there should be a period of joy in the mix of that because mm -hmm. we know where they're at. I'm yes. sure somebody and I was texting the other day and talking about crying over family members or whatever. And I said, you know what? I said, I've shed a, shed a lot of tears in 17 years because of them not being saved. But I said, uh, now that they've accepted Christ and been baptized, now my tears are because they don't serve the Lord. It, you know, but that's grief, grieving for you know people that you know that says I'm a Christian, I'm saved, and baptized, and yep. that's as far as it went, and then they went backwards. Right. You cry for them. You know what? That's sad. Yep. It is really, really sad. If we and if we look at this, this is exactly what this is talking about. We have to wear out. We have to work. We have to do. Faith without works is dead. Faith comes, and, and those works are going to come from God, the faith that you have in, in the Lord. So, next week, we're going to get more into the gold investments and their symbolism and how they tie into the New Testament. Um, it's all really, really amazing when you think about the detail, the, the intricacy that God um, has, has put in order, and he's put it in this book for us to read it, you know, and um, it's a shame, it's a shame that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people who claim to be Christian who don't even care about this book, you know, because it's the most amazing thing on this earth, is this right here, is this book, it's the most amazing thing, yes. Well, you know, you hear a lot of people are like, well, it's kind of different because it's not by works, but there's a verse in there where it says, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works, right, speaking of the faith in the Lord. Yep. But they get that too mixed up and there's right. and all. I said, it isn't kind of different. I said, I used to think so. I said, well, really, you got study in the Word. You'll find out it is not. There's if a difference between a, a dead work and a good work. Right. Yeah. The difference between a dead work and a good work. That's right. Are there any questions over this? Any comments, concerns? Well done. Good job. Right. Yes, Let's pray. Right. Our Father in heaven, Lord, your word is awesome. It's amazing. And I may not, may not be using the right word there, but it's an amazing thing to see how, how you not only reveal yourself to us through your word, you speak to us through your word, you teach us, but to see the intricacy and the detail that you uh, put everything in order and um, you allow us to, to put these things together. It's just an amazing thing when the things do come together, when you do show us. And I know your word says little by little and precept by precept. We can only eat a certain amount at a certain time. I thank you, Lord, for giving me a desire to continue to be in your word every day. And I pray that for everybody in here that this study here would give them a more of a desire to want to get into your word and see what you've done, the amazing things that you have accomplished and will accomplish. I thank you, Lord, for saving me, um, allowing me to be a part of the holy nation and the royal priesthood. 
I pray that as we continue to do these Bible studies, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our eyes and our minds to, to really see the work that you have done for us. The fact that you came here. The fact that you left your riches and became poor, that we may become poor. I mean, we may become rich. So I thank you, Lord. I pray that as we leave here that you protect us. You are worthy of all glory and honor and power and dominion and might. And I pray that everything we do here, that you would take any glory that, that we want to take upon ourselves and put it on yourself, Lord, because you are worthy, not us. I pray that you forgive us where we fail you and help us as we go out into the world to live honestly, but to tell people the truth. Not in a mean way, but just to tell them the truth. I thank you for the conversation that you allowed me to have um, with Kurt the other day. I pray that you work in his heart uh, and help him understand the truth. I pray all these things in the Lord Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen.